We want to welcome you this morning to Fresh Wind. I'm so glad that you're here. And if you're here visiting with us today, we welcome you as well. And we say a special hello to everybody who's watching online as well. And uh, thank you for joining us. And uh, we believe that we're just going to enjoy the presence of God today. And uh, if you came here today or if you tuned in online and you got stuff weighing on your mind and on your heart, this is a great day to let that go, to give it to God. The Bible says that God, that Jesus wants to partner with us to make our burdens easier. And uh, the Bible calls that yoking with him. And he actually takes part of the load, most of the load, all of the load. He's a lifter of our burdens, the lifter of our heads. Amen. What a great Savior. Father, we thank you for your great love. We thank you, God, for this opportunity that we have to gather once again. We love you. We give you praise. We ask God for a mighty outpouring of your spirit today. Lord, that we would leave different than when we came in. That our thoughts would be solely focused on you today, not on any other thing. Father, I pray that you would be pleased with our worship today. Bless all who are in attendance and all who are watching online. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So we mentioned last week, uh, if you're standing up, if you're walking around, if you're going to sing, please wear your mask. But uh, if you're going to be seated and stationary, you can feel free to remove your mask and breathe the air, okay? And uh, so just keep keep all of that in mind. If you're comfortable with that, if you prefer when you're seated to keep your mask on, you can certainly do that as well. But when you're singing and when you're out walking around, uh, please make sure you wear your mask. All right, God bless.
Christ the mighty man in this place. Hallelujah. The Bible says, right in the middle of a real gloomy book, Book of Lamentations, it says that the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases, and that his mercies, they never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And the Lord is always faithful. And he has new mercies for us, not only individually every day, but I believe as a church. God's got new mercies. God's got fresh anointing. God's got new fire, new rain. And he's going to pour it out on us. Amen. You believe that? I believe that. You believe that?
Sing it, church. Yes, I am. Oh, hallelujah. Can we just lift our hands towards heaven and give him praise this morning? Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. concept in the word about our eternal home is fantastic but I'm going to say something right now that maybe might shake some of our understanding of this but I'm committed to the word there's a hymn that says I've got a mansion just over the hilltop I know something it's not our mansion it's God's house and he said I'm going to prepare a place for you. We're going to have a place at the Father's house Amen. for all of eternity. Amen. And, uh, you know, we're, it's going to be fantastic. We get to come and go as we please. Right? You know, I, uh, I remember when my kids were little, a lot of times when something was bugging them or if they had a bad dream, they'd come and wake my wife and I up. They were free to do that. In our house we're going to be free to to uh, to bring our concerns to the Father we're going to be able to come we're, we're going to be able to go into his throne room anytime and give him praise we can't even imagine what it's going to be like to be face to face with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords in all of history everything that's going on right now in the present, it's all pointing towards that ultimate climax when Jesus comes again. Someday he's going to take us to be with him so that where he is, we may be also. What a day that's going to be. Amen. Amen. One more song this morning.
Come on, give him your praise, church. It's his breath in your lungs. Give him praise. You are worthy hallelujah. of our praise. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. We give you praise, Lord. You are worthy of our praise. Hallelujah. opportunity to be together as the body of Christ. I give you praise and glory. Thank you for your presence. Father, I pray for all that need a special touch from you. Lord, whatever the need may be, whether it's a physical need, an emotional, a spiritual, financial, I pray God that this would be a season of breakthrough for everybody. Father, as we approach your word this morning, our hearts are ready. We want to be soft and pliable in the hands of the potter. And so we give you, we give you an invitation to do what you need to do in our hearts and lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I'm just going to ask you to pay attention to a few announcements this morning, and then we'll look into the word together.
Can everybody hear me okay? Good. All right. Just want to thank uh, all those who, who uh, came over to help us paint this week and, and get things ready. And it was uh, unbelievable how fast all that came, uh, came together. And so I just want to thank you um, from the bottom of my heart. This coming Saturday is our, our move day. We're aiming to get started uh, 9 o'clock. Uh, in the morning, I was going to say nine at night so that everybody could sleep in, but nine in the morning, and uh, out in Walton, and uh, food and and uh, refreshments and whatnot will be provided uh, for anybody who would like to help us out. And uh, again, we thank you all for your kindness to us and and your generosity. And my wife and I have been uh, flabbergasted. Uh, so thank you so much, you guys. Guys, rock. All right. If you have your Bible handy, why don't you go ahead and turn, please, to Psalm 23 and verse 5. Also, an exciting announcement today. Following our service outside, not inside, but outside, it's a nice enough day. Uh, we're going to have some coffee and cookies outside. Okay? And as we fellowship together, and please uh, follow the uh, public health guidelines. That's today, right? Yeah, 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 All right, yeah, cool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, awesome. All right, we need to make sure we follow public health guidelines and all that while we're outside. And uh, after 17 or 18 months of this, I think yeah. most of us know what all that means. All right. Psalm 23 is perhaps the most famous chapter in the whole Bible. It's been called the Shepherd's Psalm, and it's fitting because it's all about the goodness of God, the goodness of the Good Shepherd. And we've been breaking this psalm down uh, statement by statement to learn all about God's goodness. Now, not everything about God's goodness is contained in Psalm 23, and not everything about God's goodness is contained in the Word. Uh, we're given what God wants us to know and what God wants us to understand. And then when we get to eternity, we're going to spend all of eternity learning all about God's goodness. Amen? All right. It's a subject that will never exhaust. And this psalm is filled with uh, so many different metaphors, so many different pictures of God's goodness. So what I want to do is just begin reading at verse 1. And then we're going to go down to verse 5 today, and, uh, and then we'll stop at the statement that we're going to focus on today. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. And then the phrase we're going to focus on today, you anoint my head with oil. May God add his blessing today to the reading of his word. You anoint my head with oil. And what does that mean? To understand this, we need to understand what anointing is, what it, what it means to be anointed. Now, it, it all depends on, on, on who is anointing you. If, if your next door neighbor came by and poured oil on your head and said, I now proclaim you king of the universe or queen of the universe, would that change your life? No. <laughs> Why? Well, the answer is simple. They have absolutely no authority to make you the ruler of the universe. Now, as we begin, I want to see what want us to see what it means to be anointed by God, which is an internal anointing, and then what it means to be anointed by another person, which is an external anointing. And so let's let's explain this and unwrap it. First of all, anointing by God. Anointing by God is something that happens internally 
when the Holy Spirit gives you insight, ability, stamina, authority, or protection that you don't normally have in order to do something that God has chosen you to do. That's anointing. And when you are anointed by God, He supernaturally uh, gives you ability that you don't have, insight and wisdom that you don't have, stamina to hold up under something that you don't have, authority or protection that you don't normally have in order for you to do something that God has chosen you to do. It's an internal anointing and that is anointing by God. Then the other one is anointing by people. And that's something different. It is an outward symbol of the inward thing that we just talked about. It's an external symbol. Anointing by people means when somebody prayerfully applies some oil to your skin as an outward sign of what God is doing inside of you. Now God often gives an external symbol of an internal process. An example of this would be the Lord's Supper, which we celebrated together last week. Communion is an external symbol of the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Baptism is another example. It's an outward sign of an inward truth. It is saying that I have died to my old way of thinking and then I put them under the water and uh, as I do that, it's an outward symbol that that person has been born again as they place their faith and trust in Jesus Christ and the washing of the water, the washing of the Lord, the cleansing of the Lord, going under the water is symbolic of all of that being washed and wiped out of your life. And then when you come back up out of the water, that's a symbol of new life in you, resurrection power. Our old has been, uh, uh, our old nature has died and was buried and we come up a brand new creation. Communion and baptism, by the way, don't save you. They're symbols. And when someone anoints you with oil, there are no mystical or magical properties in the oil. I remember seeing uh, a couple of TV evangelists advertising anointing oil from Israel in beautiful hue aluminum vial. And if you send your donation, they'll send you this beautiful prayer anointing that will increase your chance to get healed. Another guy offered little packets of miracle spring water from Chernobyl. I'll just move on and leave that one alone. <laughs> There's no mystical or magical properties in the oil. There's no, nothing supernatural or mystical that happens when you open a pack of miracle spring water from Chernobyl. The oil is a symbol of something far more significant and the faith that God has anointed you on the inside. In the Bible, olive oil is used as a symbol of a lot of things. It's a symbol of the Holy Spirit. It's a symbol of God's presence. It's a symbol of God's blessing on your life. When you're anointed with oil, it's a symbol that God proves of you. It's a symbol of God's protection and His promises. It's a symbol of comfort and of healing and of joy. The Bible talks about the oil of joy, the oil of gladness. It's a symbol of many different things. Now, in the, in the Old Testament, only three kinds of people got anointed with oil. You had to either be a priest, a prophet, or a king. The only people who could do the anointing were the priests. Nobody else was allowed to anoint in the Old Testament. But when Jesus Christ died on the cross, he broke up the old system. And the Bible says that the veil in the temple was torn in two, which means that you can go directly to God now. You don't need a human priest. You don't need a human high priest. Jesus is your high priest. And through Jesus, we have direct access to the Father. In fact, if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says that you're a priest. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 to 5, talks about us as a holy priesthood. As you come to him, the living stone, 
rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices to God through Jesus Christ. Now, maybe you've never thought of yourself in that light before. If you follow Christ, you're a priest, and you have direct access to God. So I take it then that as a priest, you have the authority to anoint people with oil and pray for them. Does that make sense? As a priest, you have the authority to pray for people's healing. And we're looking at the phrase today, you anoint my head with oil. And in order to understand what it means to live an anointed life, we've, we've got to get back to the basics. Okay? I mean, you've heard me say this here before. You are not an accident. You were made by God and for God. And until you understand that fact, life will not make sense. God has a plan and a purpose for your life. And significance in life comes from discovering and understanding God's plan for your life. Before you were even born, God had a plan for your life. And it's called your calling. Did you know that you are called by God to do something with your life? Now everybody who is alive has a calling by God on their life. And many people miss that calling and they go off and do their own thing. And that's why they're unhappy. And that's why they're unsatisfied. And that's why they're unfulfilled. There's a hole in our lives that only God can fill. There's a void in our lives that only God can satisfy. Now, some people think that God only calls pastors and evangelists and, and missionaries and, and people who do church work. But it's simply not true. We all are a holy priesthood. God has a calling on your life. And what God calls you to do, he wants to anoint you to do. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Before you were even born, God prepared or planned the calling on your life. And this is very important. And here's the catch. You cannot fulfill your calling the way God wants you to on your own power. Amen. You need God's anointing. God's anointing allows you to do what God wants you to do. So, I want to give you some statements today about the anointing of God from the Bible. And this will be a summary of, of things that the Bible says about living the anointed life. And it's important to understand these things to live in God's anointing. So let's go through these. Number one, when God appoints me, he anoints me. When God appoints me, he anoints me. God never asks you to do something without providing what you need to do it. When he gives you an assignment, he's going to give you the empowerment. When he gives you a plan, he's going to give you the power to do it. And the anointing that God wants to give you only happens when you start using it for what he wants to give it to you for. When God calls you to do something and you feel scared or incompetent, God says this, 1 Thessalonians 5, 24, the one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. So when God tells you to do something, you have no reason to be scared. You have no reason to be fearful. If you step out of faith and do it, God will empower you. Kind of a little bit like getting into your car. You can't expect to get into your car and, uh, and, and make it drive if you just sit in there and sit behind the wheel. You gotta do something. You gotta put the key in the ignition. You gotta crank it over. You gotta put the car in drive. And then you gotta depress the accelerator. You gotta take a step of faith in your life. And when you do, God will empower you. He's going to give you the ability to do it. His spirit is already in you. 
And the Bible says that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in us. We have, we are containers of the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Amen. And when God tells you to do it, you can count on God's anointing. He is faithful and he will do it. Now, a good example of this is when he gave some instructions to the apostles before he ascended. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And when Jesus gave them that instruction, it was an impossible assignment. There was no way they could possibly go to the ends of the earth. But guess what? God made it happen. He poured the Holy Spirit on them. They were filled with power. They were filled with anointing. And they turned the whole world upside down. God's appointment has an anointing that goes right along with it. So when God appoints me, he anoints me. Number two, God's anointing makes me a better person. God's anointing transforms you. It changes you. It gives you abilities you did not have on your own. And there are many examples of this in the Bible. A great example is, is found in 1 Samuel chapter 10. Now Samuel is a prophet. He's the, the first king of Israel is a man named Saul. Saul at one point felt very inadequate. He thought that he could never be the king. 1 Samuel 10 verse 1. Then Samuel took a flask of oil and poured it on Saul's head and kissed him saying, Has not the Lord anointed you leader over his inheritance? God had an anointing on Saul. Saul is anointed, but he's still having trouble believing it. So Samuel, over the next several verses, gives Saul some signs to prove what he's saying is true. And then down in verses 6 and 7, Samuel tells Saul that this is what's going to confirm his calling as king. The Spirit of the Lord will come upon you in power. And you will prophesy with them, and you will be changed into a different person. And once these signs are fulfilled... Do whatever your hand finds to do, for God is with you. Now what's this verse teaching? When you receive God's anointing on your life, it changes you. How? You're going to be more competent. You're going to be more confident. You're going to be calmer. You're going to be more confident about what God has called you to do. And you're going to be, you're going to have a calmness about you. You are going to fret and worry over every little thing. You're going you're gonna to do what all those slogans say. You're going to relax and let God handle it. And when you're worried and nervous in your calling, I want to submit that you're discarding the anointing of God on your life at that moment. When you let go and let God, God comes into your life and he changes you. And all of a sudden, you have a lot more confidence about what he's called you to do. So God's anointing just, it makes me a better person. Number three, God's anointing makes difficult tasks easier. The anointing makes difficult tasks easier because you're no longer doing it on your own power. You're relying on God's power. And the difference between serving in your own power and serving with God's power is like night and day. I want to show you the difference between an anointed life and an unanointed life. Ephesians 3.16. Paul says, I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. See, my resources are limited. My knowledge is limited. My wisdom is limited. My wife didn't say amen there, but I know she's saying it in her heart. No, I'm <laughs> my talent is limited. But God is not limited in any area. And when God puts his resources in your life, his limitless mighty strength comes in you and fills your inmost being with his strength. And when you face tough situations, you're not re relying on your limitations, but you are relying on God's limitlessness, which he puts inside of you. And you can face the difficulties with a different attitude. You can last longer. And you can go farther. 
because you have God's anointing on your life. Now, how do you know when you don't have God's anointing on your life? I'll tell you. You're tired all the time. We try to solve all our own problems, all on our own power. And you know what? That wears us down. It wears us out. And this verse says that God empowers you with inner strength through the Holy Spirit. One of the ministries of the Holy Spirit is to anoint you. Empowering is anointing. And part of his ministry is to empower you with strength, grace, energy, all the stuff you need to get done, what, what God has called you to do. You don't need a can of Red Bull. You need to tap into the power of the Holy Spirit. Yes. Philippians 4, 13. And how quickly believers forget this verse. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Let's say it again. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. And if you're not depending on the Holy Spirit for strength, you're depending on yourself for strength, and you're going to end up tired and fatigued and worn out. So I want to ask you a personal question. I heard somebody say, uh oh. <laughs> Are you trying to do everything in your life based on adrenaline or based on anointing? See, adrenaline runs out. But God's power does not. God's power is even better than the Energizer Bunny. Even he runs out at times, the Energizer Bunny. I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. We know that verse, we quote that verse. Do we live it? Do we believe it? You know, you, you can fill in the blank with, with other things here. I can, things that people have tried. I can do everything through my miracle med medications. I can do everything through my team that backs me up. Another attitude. I can do everything through my savings account. Well, every time you, you draw strength from your savings account, at some point it's going to dry up. I can keep going on with examples, but we need to draw strength from a well that will never run dry. Amen. I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. You know what the word Christ means? Some people believe that Christ is Jesus' last name, but it's not. It's a title. Jesus the Christ. And it means the anointed one. Jesus the anointed one. And it's the anointed one who gives you your anointing. Hebrew equivalent of that is Messiah. Because Messiah literally means anointed one. Christ and Messiah are the same person. So when God appoints me, he anoints me. And God's anointing makes me a better person. It makes difficult tasks easier. Number four, God's anointing makes the impossible possible. God can do things that, that we would never be able to do. And it's a big deal because in your life, you're going to come up against insurmountable problems and you're going to need the anointing of God. You could have problems in your marriage that seem insurmountable. You could have problems with your health that seem insurmountable. insurmountable. What do you depend on? You depend on God's anointing. Luke 18, verse 27. What is impossible for people is possible with God. I can't do everything, but God can. Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than, we, than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Now I want everybody just to close their eyes for just a moment. All of you watching online, close your eyes too. I want you to think of the greatest thing that God could ever do for you. What's the greatest thing that God could ever do for you? What's the greatest thing that you can imagine happening in your life? I know if Nathaniel were here, he would say, a Lamborghini. He's down listening with my mom and dad. Now, whatever you just imagined, 
ever says that God can do immeasurably more than that. Immeasurably more than that. God's anointing makes the impossible possible. You can open your eyes again. Maybe you're here and you just needed to hear that. I don't know what impossibility you're facing. You need to walk out of here today with the realization God is able. Number five, God anoints my life to bless others. God blesses you, not just so you can feel good. God blesses you so that you can be a blessing to other people. We're blessed to be a blessing. Now, in Isaiah 61, Isaiah talks about anointing. This is a passage that is uh, first and foremost prophetic about Christ, who at that point was yet to come. But I believe Isaiah is also talking about his anointing as a prophet. He mentioned several things about the anointing here. Isaiah 61, verses 1 to 3. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. Powerful, powerful verses. But we do serve an amazing God, and he is interested in your emotional needs. He is interested in your hurts. He's interested in all of the stuff that pulls you down. And when he anoints you, he wants you to help other people who are in pain. And when you do that, God helps you in your pain. I don't know if you realize this or not, this, this passage from Isaiah chapter 61 is the exact passage that Jesus read for his very first public sermon. It's in Luke chapter 4. Jesus goes back to his hometown in Nazareth and he picks up the Isaiah scroll and he opens it up to Isaiah 61 and Jesus reads those words. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He reads it. He rolls up the scroll. He goes and sits down to where the, uh, the, the teacher sits. And then he said to them, today, this passage is fulfilled right in front of you. He was telling the people that he was the anointed one. Acts 10 verse 38, God anointed, of Jesus, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power and how he went about, went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. Now listen, we are followers of Christ. We're Christians. I heard one preacher say that Jesus is the anointed one and we are uh, his followers. We're anointlings. <laughs> Jesus was anointed. We're anointed. Now what are we to do? The Bible says he went around doing good. And so we're to go around doing good. Coming to church for 60 minutes on a Sunday is fantastic, but it doesn't cut it for the whole week. We follow Christ, we do what he did. He went around doing good, we go around doing good. He healed all who were under the power of the devil. As priests, we can take authority over the power of the devil right here in Wingham and see people saved, set free, and healed. God was with him. God is with us. Emmanuel, God with us. He's our high priest. We're the priesthood. And he wants to do his work through us. Think of that old chorus that we used to sing uh, in our church when we were growing up. Oh, to be his hand extended, reaching out to the oppressed. Let me touch him. Let me touch Jesus so that others may know and be blessed. Number six, for every new challenge, I need a fresh anointing. This is an important point. So I'm gonna ask everybody to pay close attention. Anointing by the Holy Spirit in your life cannot be stored up. 
You can't say, yeah, I remember when I went to the service back in the early 90s and God touched me and I cried and it was a real experience. You can't carry that anointing 30 years later. Now some people believe that. But I'm here to tell you this morning, you can't live off of past anointing. You see, God wants us to depend on him every day for fresh anointing. When Jesus taught us to pray, he did not say, give us this day our monthly bread. <laughs> he said our daily bread. He gives you enough for that day, and tomorrow you're going to need a fresh anointing. So I'm going to say something right now. I know that this church used to rock and roll. It, had, it was full, and there were, there were good things going on. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We can't live in that anointing. We need a fresh anointing for today. Yeah. He gives you enough for today, and then tomorrow when you need a fresh anointing, he'll give you enough for tomorrow. And the day after that, and every day for the rest of your life, you need a fresh anointing. And I don't know if you knew this or not, but you can lose the anointing. Now we've all seen people who were used greatly by God and they're gifted and talented and then two years later they're on the shelf doing nothing. There's songs that, that are in our songbook that were written by people who loved the Lord back in that day but right now are atheists. How do they lose God's blessing on their lives? How do you lose God's blessing on your life? There's lots of ways. You can lose his blessing by taking it for granted or by not depending on him or by not spending the long time with God every day. And you can lose it through pride and you can lose it through greed. You can lose it by refusing to, give some, to forgive somebody that you need to forgive. You can, you can lose it by gossiping. You can lose it by out of control anger. You can lose it whenever you are or, or something else be more important in your life before God. And we, need, we all need a fresh refilling. Yes. Yes. Next week we're going to talk about the phrase, my cup runs over. And I believe that God wants to fill us so much that we overflow. Amen. But I believe that God wants to do that every day, Lord. Mm -hmm. He wants to fill us to overflowing every day. You know what the problem is? We all leak. <laughs> all right? If you don't get a fresh anointing, you can empty yourself of all the passion and the power. Maybe that was a bad uh... I'm going to pause for a moment and have a drink of water. Hopefully not leak. <laughs> Let's use this. It's kind of like a balloon at a birthday party. Three days after the party, it has significantly uh, uh, deflated and it's no good for anything. Okay, we need a fresh anointing every day on a regular basis. I want this next verse, Hosea 10 verse 12. So for yourself righteousness. Now that's a metaphor for prayer. Reap the fruit of unfailing love and break up your unplowed ground. You know this. Maybe there's farmers in this church. On farms, the ground can become hard and crusty and dry. You know, sometimes our hearts can be like that. The joy of the Lord is dried up. We become hard to God and hard to people. And if that's you, it's time to do a little plowing and break up the unplowed ground. For it is time to seek the Lord until he comes and showers righteousness on you. Now, how does God turn the hard ground of our hearts into soft, fertile ground, he sends a storm. Got any storms going on in your life? God might be using that storm to plow up the fallow ground of your heart. Follow the instructions of that verse. Pray. That's what it means. Sow for yourselves righteousness. It means pray. Break up the unplowed ground. 
And we do that through humility and confession. And then it says, seek the Lord. And then what will happen? He will shower righteousness and blessing and anointing on you. How do you get God's anointing back in your life? Or how do you get it for maybe the first time? The number one way is you ask. And James 4 verse 2 says, you do not have because you do not ask God. And if you don't have God's power in your life, if you don't have God's blessing and anointing in your life, then you're not waiting on God. He's waiting on you. You have to ask God. Now, when was the last time you asked God to make your career successful? And then you go about and continue to do it in your own way. Do you do it how he tells you to do it? When was the last time you asked God to make your marriage successful? And then you say, well, God, I'll just, I'll just do it anyway. When was the last time you asked God to bless your finances, but you don't do it God's way and honor God with your tithes and offerings? And he tells you to do it. God wants to bless your life, your life in ways that you have not even imagined. And the key is, we have to do it his way. It can't be the way of Gilbert. It has to be the way of God. His way and not mine. Psalm 84 verse 11, For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. Did you catch that? We do it his way. He's not going to withhold any good thing from your life. The next verse, Psalm 84, verse 12. O Lord Almighty, blessed is the man who trusts in you. I want to close today by reading you a testimony written by somebody you probably heard of, D.L. Moody. And this is concerning the anointing which we talked about today. So listen to this. Yep, these are the words of D.L. Moody. I remember two holy women who used to come to my meetings. It was delightful to see them in the congregation. And when I began to preach, I could tell by the expression on their faces that they were praying for me. At the close of the Sunday evening service, they would say to me, we've been praying for you. I said, well, why don't you pray for the people? And they answered, you need power. I need power, I said to myself. Why, well, I thought I had power. I had a large Sunday school and the largest congregation in Chicago. There were some conversions at that time. I was, in a sense, satisfied. But right along, these two godly women kept praying for me and their earnest talk about being anointed for special service set me to thinking. I asked them to come and talk with me and we got down on our knees and they poured out their hearts that I might receive the anointing from the Holy Spirit. And there came a great hunger into my soul. I did not know what it was. And I began to pray as I never did before. I really felt that I did not want to live if I could not have this power for service. And the hunger increased. And I was praying all the time that God would fill me with his Holy Spirit. This is a preacher, folks. One day in the city of New York, oh, what a day, I cannot describe it. I seldom refer to it, it is almost too sacred an experience to name. Paul had an experience of which he never spoke for 14 years. And I can only say that God revealed himself to me. And I had such an experience of his love that I asked him to stay his hand. And I went to preaching again. The sermons were not different. I did not present any new truths. And yet hundreds were converted. I would not now be placed back where I was before that blessed experience. If God gave me all of Glasgow, it would be as small, it would be as the small dust of the balance. He goes on to say, if we are full of the spirit, anointed, our words will reach the hearts of the people. We need the filling always. And if we are filled for the Spirit, there will be no room for Satan or self. If we're filled with the Spirit and full of power, one day's work is better than a year without. It is the work of the Holy Spirit to get the secrets of eternity and reveal them to us. My work is to preach and the Holy Spirit 
convicts men of sin. We, we all need a fresh anointing every day. We got to stop depending on the old anointing. We got to stop having this attitude, well, if we do it this way, we're going to see better results. I'll tell you what, the Bible says that the mercies of the Lord are new every morning. God wants to do something new and something fresh, a fresh wind. Amen. Let's bow. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your great love. We thank you for this anointing. Lord, when you call us, you anoint us. When you give us a task to do, to fulfill, you give us the power and everything that we need to fulfill it. You are a great God. Pray, Father, that you would forgive us when we've tried to do it our, our own way instead of yours. May we lead all of our lives and do it your way. Father, I pray that you would bless our church. That you would give fresh wind a brand new anointing. Fill us with, fill us with fresh fire. Fresh oil from the throne. And a new anointing, God. Father, as the pastor of this church, I seek that. I seek you, God, for new anointing and fresh fire on me. I pray that for our work, God, and for all of us. Heads bowed and eyes closed. Maybe you're here today or maybe you're watching online. You do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. I'll tell you, there's no greater anointing than that. And you need to say yes to Jesus Christ. It says in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, that if I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord, that I believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead, that I will be saved. Maybe you haven't done that ever. This is your moment. This is your moment. Just bow and say something like this, Heavenly Father. I know that I'm a sinner. And I open my heart to you today. I say with my lips that Jesus Christ is Lord. I believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead. And I ask you, Father, to forgive me of my sins. To make me a brand new person. To follow you, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. If you said that prayer today, you said something like it, you gave your heart to the Lord, you made Jesus your Lord and Savior, I'll welcome you into the family of God. And I would love for you to get in contact with me. I would like to encourage you in your steps as a new believer. Pastor Jason at HurontTel.ON.ca. I'll get back to you and respond. Also, we rely on donations here, tithes and offerings. And if you would like to donate to the Lord's work here at Fresh Wind, you can do so through an e-transfer, fwrcdonation at gmail.com, and that will come directly to us. I want to close with Hebrews 13, verses 20 and 21. I love these verses. May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. And everybody said, Amen. God bless you. Have a great day.